الله أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين <تصفيق> صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة العمى يا غريب يا مذلوم يا أتشان كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم ولا من من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق والأستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور أمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وآل محمد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us in this world such that we perish. But rather God has created us with a purpose. And that our time in this dunya is a stage from amongst the many stages that we have to endure during the course of our existence. God, He created us, He created our souls thousands thousands of years before He physically planted Adam onto this earth. We lived in what is known as Alam al-Malakut or Alam al-Dhar. Thereafter, we lived in Alam al-Arham or the world of the womb of our own mothers. Thereafter, we were exposed to this world known as Alam al-Dunya. After Alam al-Dunya, we will transition into Alam al-Barzakh. After Alam al-Barzakh, we will be raised on the Day of Judgment which according to traditions lasts for 50,000 years. And after we live in that stage, we move on to Alam Al-Khuld, the eternal world. Inshallah, in paradise, in the company of the best of creation and his most perfect family. Life is about going through stages. As the hadith of the Prophet, he states, Darun ila dar. We're just moving homes. We're moving a manifestation that is physical, into another reality that is a little bit different than this one. Because at the end of the day, it's important for us to realize that every step that we take and every twinkling of the eye and every day that passes by on the calendar, it's another movement in this really, really long journey of the human being. As much as I desire to consistently be six years old for the rest of my life, I can't. I don't have control over that. I'm not going to be six forever. I have to be seven. I have to be eight. I have to be nine. I have to grow up. I have to get older. I have to get bigger. I may not like the fact that I'm aging every single day or at every single moment or every time I look at myself in the mirror, I see more gray hairs on my beard. But at the end of the day, that's not in my own control because that goes against the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God has created laws which govern this universe. And amongst the laws that he applies which govern this universe is that we transition into this world but also out of this world. In other words, a conversation around our own mortality or around death is something normal and natural. Every single human being has to endure 
a transition from this world to the next. In fact, death is the guarantee and life in itself has no such guarantee. Once we have been given life, we are guaranteed to die. That's just the reality of this world that we live in. And again, if we change our mindset and understand that it's solely a transition from this world to the next world, in the same way that I transition from the womb of my mother into this dunya, all of a sudden it doesn't sound that bad. If I rewind my life 35 plus years ago, going back to when I was warm and when I was comfortable and when I was satiated in the womb of my very own mother, and someone were to come and tell me, we are going to remove you from this location and we are going to plant you into this dunya. And you're going to be surrounded by people. And you're going to be surrounded by a lot of lights. And you're going to be surrounded by a lot of noises. And you're going to be surrounded by a lot of obnoxious things and people and individuals that we are exposed to in this world. What would we have responded? No, I'm good. I'm very comfortable in the womb of my mother. My mom loves me. She cares about me. She knows when I'm hungry. But when I go out into that world, I'm not ready for it. What happens? We don't have a say. When the time comes, we transition. And we enter into this dunya. And how does a child enter into this world? Except he or she screams and cries as loud as he or she possibly could. Because everything is so different at this moment. But then what happens? We adjust. We grow. We figure it out. Those first couple of years... It's difficult. I tell my daughter all the time, Maryam, she always says, Baba, you always talk about Zainab, you never talk about me. She always says, I always get hurt and it's so hard being a kid and I have to go to school and I want to come back and I want to just stay with you guys. I say, Baba, I'm so sorry. Being a kid is really difficult. It's hard. It's challenging. But as you get older, you start to figure it out. And you don't necessarily want to go back into the womb of your mother as sometimes as pleasurable as that might seem or sound. Because at the end of the day, you build relationships. You have friends. You have family. You have spouse. You have children. You don't want to rewind your life 30 some odd years. You know that there's something more to live for. Such is life. We go through various stages during the course of our existence And amongst those stages that we have to encounter and that we have to endure is death. Is the reality of that moment when our soul leaves our body. And for today's discussion, inshaAllah ta'ala, I want to reflect upon death in three different dimensions. The first dimension is answering the question of why should we talk about death in the first place. The second question is, with regards to how or why most people fear death. And thirdly and finally, understanding what happens to the human being in the final moments before death. So let's jump right into dimension number one. Why should we have this conversation in the first place? Why should we talk about something like death in the first place? When I say death, when I say dying, when I say grave, the first images that come to my mind are of darkness, or of, 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 again, things that are often negatively connoted. Again, we always take a look at religion through this deficit approach. What's wrong with talking about death? Why do we always have this sort of morbid assumption of what death is? If it's only a transition that we make from this world into the next, why is it something so fearful? Why is it something that we're so worried about? Or a better question that you should ask is, You see all of you sheikhs, all you guys do is talk about negative things. You want to scare us into death so that all of a sudden we start listening to all of your instructions. No, that's not my style. You all know that. We We have to take a look at things with a little bit more of a positive light. The better question that we should be asking ourselves is, why not talk about death? In fact, why do we run away from a conversation which is an absolute certainty that every single one of us are going to experience? If I know that I'm going to move into a new neighborhood, or if I know that I'm going to go to this particular college, wouldn't it be best for me to go and visit that neighborhood or that home or that apartment building before I put down that deposit, before I rent it out, before I commit to that school? It would be smart for me to go and visit it, go and see the situation, go and see what life is like on that particular college campus. 
Naturally, we would do such a thing. Because you know that that's where you're going to go. Now, let me just get a little bit of a preview, so to say, before I commit to it. We're already committed. We're already committed to death intrinsically. We can't do anything about that. So might as well know what's going on, right? Might as well know a little bit about it. Because otherwise, we'd be making a decision that is fairly foolish, no? So firstly and foremostly, why talk about death? Because in reality, a conversation about death is a conversation about life. It's the same thing like we talked about a couple of nights ago, that in life it's important for us to plan. It's important for us to look forward to that which is going to absolutely happen tomorrow. And if we know that we are traversing toward the world beyond this one, then why not do a little bit of research, so to say? A second reason why having this conversation about death is so vital and so important is because Speaking about death allows for us to plan more appropriately and be successful in that journey. Let me give you an example. If you open up a text like that of Nahj al balagha of Sharif al radi where he compiles all of these ahadith and traditions and sermons and sayings from Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi, just go and scan through the pages. Don't even read from A to Z. You should read from A to Z. But if you just scan through the pages... I guarantee you that every so few pages, you're going to see Imam Ali والسلام, talking about the reality of death. In fact, he himself عليه, says, he says, I yearn for death more than a child yearns for the nipple of his mother. At the end of the day, what he's trying to say is that I'm looking forward to that reality because I know for sure that that is where I'm going. And at the same time, I know that that world is better than this one. We rewind our life back to the womb of our mother. The ability for us to grow, the ability for us to see and experience everything that we experience in this dunya, we don't, we, we're limited and shackled literally by a physical space. But then when we enter into this world, we realize that there's so much more to do, so much more to see, so much more to experience. When I die and when I enter into the barzakh and when I'm raised on the Day of Judgment and when I'm granted paradise in the company of the Prophet and his family, السلام, just imagine how much more I'm exposed to. It's all about this path toward perfection that we spoke about a couple of nights ago as well. So through this remembrance and through this recognition that I will absolutely die and engaging in that conversation, it allows for me to prepare and be successful on that journey. In contrast to the primary sort of villain in the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib, عليه, which is Muawiyah, for instance. Muawiyah could care less about death. Muawiyah could care less about the world beyond this one. He's only consumed by this world. He feels that he is going to live forever, like every other tyrant, like every other ruler, like every other politician who only, de- who only desires power. They think that they're going to live forever. But for Ahlul Bayt, السلام, for the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're consistently in a state of recognition that they're not here forever, so might as well know what's going to happen tomorrow. And that brings me then to the second dimension of the discussion. Which is, why is it then that we fear death? If it's just the transition from one universe, from one stage of life to the next stage of life, why is it that I fear it? Most people probably fear death because it's a fear of the unknown. They don't know what to expect. And in reality, that makes perfect, logical, rational sense. We have an intellectual principle that we employ within Islamic law, uh, as well as Islamic ethics, which is known as daf al darar that the human being is naturally inclined to push away any difficulty or hardship. Someone comes to you and throws something in your face, naturally we are inclined to put up our hand and blocking that so it doesn't hit our face, for instance. It's normal, it's natural. And when we see ourselves walking into harm's way, for instance, immediately the normal, rational response is to make sure that we deviate from the way that we're walking and not go into that direction which is going to put us in harm's way. It's obvious, it's normal, it's natural. And for most people, our fear of death is a fear of an unknown. We don't know what to expect. 
or we know what to expect, or we assume that we know what to expect, and we realize that it might be something challenging, it might be something that we should fear, it might be a hurdle that we have to overcome, so let me figure out a way to deflect it, not talk about it, ignore it, put it under the rug, so to say. But in reality, again, is death something really that we're walking into that we should be fearful in the first place? It goes back once again to the same conversation that I consistently mention to you all. Our perception of who God is is so negative, is so negative that even a transition, a step that we're making in terms of growth, returning back to Him, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. What are we saying? To Allah we belong and to Him is our return. Wouldn't you love to return back to the one that you love? We talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He literally tells us that He loves us. And then He says, don't you want to return back to the one that you love? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We hear those words. Immediately we get scared. Who died? What happened? Is everything okay? No. Our perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we're going to Allah to be punished. We're going to Allah to be thrown into the fires of hell. We're going to Allah so that He can wage His vengeance against us. Listen to me, my sisters and my brothers and my friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He cared for us when we were insignificant in the womb of our mothers. We were insignificant. God knows how small that we were. And then we were born into this world. And we needed the care and the tender support of our family to survive past the first month, three months, six months, year of our life. God took care of us year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. With His mercy, with His grace, with His generosity, with His love, with His compassion. One day we are going to leave this world and our assumption is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's it, He's left us. He doesn't care about us anymore. No. That same God who cared for you when you were insignificant in the womb of your mother is the same God who will care for you when you are lowered into your grave and when you are raised up on the Day of Judgment and when you enter into paradise holding the hand of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have this perception that once our souls leave our body, no more God, no more mercy, no more compassion, no more love. What are we talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us to absolutely depart from this dunya. But to assume that God doesn't disperse His mercy in the same way that He cared for us as tender and as small and as tiny as we were one day and won't have that same love and care and tenderness for us tomorrow. Well then my friends, we just got it wrong. So why is it then that we fear death? Once we know who God is, once we build that relationship through that lens of love, all of a sudden, everything makes more sense. I give you the example of Qasim, alayhi, who we spoke about a couple of nights ago. Qasim ibn al-Hasan, we mentioned, according to different historical reports, the eldest that he is in the Maqatil literature is 16 years old. But most reports suggest that he had not yet reached the age of puberty. He was a child, 13, 14, 12, God knows. Qasim ibn al-Hasan alayhi salam, we recite in his maqtal that when he went out to go and fight, he kills X amount of people, so on and so forth, until what? Until he realizes that his slipper was broken and he bends down to fix his slipper and one of the army of Amr ibn Sa'd comes and strikes the son of Hassan ibn Ali on the head. Salam Allah alayhi. Let me ask you a question. When you go out and you are rushing toward the subway, or you are playing a sport with your friends. You're going out for a run, you're playing basketball, whatever it might be. When you're focused on something, oftentimes people have to come and tell you, hey man, your shoelace is untied, you're going to trip. Happens all the time. Because you're so focused, for instance, on getting to your destination, you're so in the zone, your adrenaline is rushing to fulfill whatever your task is that you forget sometimes that you didn't tie your shoelaces or you don't realize that your shoelaces got untied. Right? Awesome was not playing a game. 
He wasn't rushing to catch a train. He was in the middle of battle with 30,000 of the most demonic, of the most tyrannical, of the most satanic human beings surrounding him, ready to shed the blood of the son of the daughter of the messenger of God. Why was Qasim more concerned with the slipper than with the enemy? Why? Qasim wasn't concerned with this world. He didn't fear death. Even at that age. So he looks down at his slipper like a kid walking down the park and realizing that their slipper was broken. And he looks down without any concern until that man comes and he strikes his head. Imam al Hussein, sallallahu alayhi one of the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, one of the commanders of the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad, state that in those last moments after everyone had been killed, he goes out to fight. And they call out amongst themselves, Umburu ilay la yubali bil maut. Look at Hussein. Look at Hussein. Death doesn't faze him. He's not concerned about death. What is Hussein seeing? Imam al Hussein, sallallahu alayhi is already living in the akhirah. He's not concerned about those around him. We, every single one of us, if we know God, this world doesn't faze us anymore. And we begin to see this world with the sense of clarity, with the sense of understanding. Again, the sense of beauty and of mercy and of compassion that we are moving on from one stage of our existence to the next stage. And that brings me then to the third dimension of discussion. What happens then at the final moments of someone's life. And I want to respond to this question in three sub-dimensions. Sub-dimension number one. What exactly is the last moment of someone's life? According to our ahadith, the last moment of someone's life is what is known as al-ihtidar, or the moment when those around the one who's about to be deceased are present. It comes from the root word hudur. Because many people are in the presence of that individual. Let me give you an example. When someone is about to die, more often than not, under normal circumstances, other than, unfortunately, very difficult and trying situations, or as we experienced during COVID, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon all of your loved ones, and particularly those who passed away in this really, really horrific time over the last couple of years where families were unable to be around their loved ones. Under normal circumstances, you have the close relatives, the spouse, the parents, the children, closest blood relatives who are present at the time of someone's departure. In addition to that, al-hudur, al-ihtidar, is for instance, when the angels are present. And amongst the angels that are present is Malik al-Mawt, salamu Allah alayhi. Peace and blessings be upon the angel of death. Why peace and blessings be upon the angel of death? He's an angel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a quick parenthesis, my teacher in the holy city of Karbara, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Taqal Madarasi, he would always say that when you go and visit Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, make sure that you remember everyone, your family, your friends, those who asked you to make dua and so on and so forth. And he said that, and don't forget that when you are making ziyarah of Imam al-Husayn, also make ziyara on behalf of Malik al-Mawt, on the angel of death. Why? He says, because maybe he'll be a little bit more gentle with you. <laughs> you, made, you made ziyara of Imam al-Husayn on his behalf as well. Inshallah, he'll, he'll, he'll pay you back for that. So, salamu alaykum Malik al-Mawt, wherever you're at, have mercy upon all of us. Amongst those who are present, the angels. And amongst them, Malik al-Mawt. Amongst those who are also present at the time of someone's death is Iblis, or the shayateen. Which is why another name for the last moment of someone's life is what is known as Adila. Many of you might have heard of this famous du'a that we recite known as Du'a al-Adila. A du'a that is recommended to be recited. It actually doesn't come from any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, but taught to us by some of our ulama. That at the last moment of someone's life, reaffirm for them who Allah is, who the Prophet is, who the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are, so on and so forth. And the word Adila comes from the root word Yu'addil, which means to posit or to change your opinion with regards to something. Or to amend what you priorly believed into what you believe now. In other words, what we are told from the 
verses of the Qur'an, as well as numerous ahadith of Ahlul Bayt السلام, that that last hour, or those final moments before someone leaves this dunya, is the last test and the last trial that a human being has to endure. And someone who may have believed in God for 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 80 years, at that moment, they could be swayed into disbelief just by the pain and the difficulty that they would be enduring at that moment. What happens? It is said that the family members are going to surround their loved one and they're going to recite Quran next to them. They're going to weep over them. They're going to grieve over them. And the angel is going to be preparing to remove the soul from that body. And at that moment, the shayateen are going to surround us as well and say, O Fayaz, where is your God now? Where is God's mercy now? Why are you in so much pain? Why are you in so much difficulty? Let me tell you, if you disbelieve in God at this moment, I'll get your back. I'll support you. I'll make this pain stop. I'll push away these angels. Because at that moment, the veils between this world and the next world are lifted. And we begin to see with a sense of clarity what is going to happen in the next world. But the shayateen, Iblis himself at the forefront of them, begins to paint this picture of what life would potentially be like if we follow him. He's of course deceiving us, as he deceives us so many a times during the course of this world. Someone says, what's the evidence for this? A numerous ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam. And so at that moment, so many a believer can amend their prior belief and all of a sudden fall into kufr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allow for their entirety of the religion to be thrown away. This is what is known as adila or al-ihtidar. That brings me then to the second dimension. Everyone following? That brings me then to the second sub-dimension here, which is how could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow for that to happen? This is God who is merciful. Someone who believed for 50 years, all it takes for them is one or two hours at the very last moments of their life and everything fades and everything goes away. How could it be? Where is the mercy of God? My friends, there are two factors to keep in mind here. Factor number one is that our faith and our iman and our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could be one of two. For a believer... Either we could consistently have conviction and certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or on the flip side, we can be an individual who has our faith wavering consistently. On one side, we can be staunch as could be. No matter what the circumstance, we submit to whatever God wants from us. But on the flip side, there are plenty of people, for instance, and we need to look within ourselves and I look within myself, that sometimes if things don't particularly go my way, I begin to ask God questions. Or I begin to doubt in God Himself. Where is God? Where is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allows for X and Y and Z to happen? During the pandemic, the biggest question that an atheist would ask a believer is, where's your God? Why is He allowing for this pandemic to engulf the entirety of the world. Where is Allah? We talked about a couple of nights ago, responses to some of these questions. But for many of us, if we haven't internalized them, we haven't believed in them, we haven't accepted them, at that moment, anything could happen. Because our faith in reality wasn't real. As I mentioned, C.S. Lewis, that famous writer we talked about a couple of nights ago, he says that when my wife died of this terminal illness, this Christian theologian, he says, I realized that my faith was like a stack of cards. All it takes is one blow of wind and everything falls to the ground. When we go through difficulty, when we're going through hardship, how many of us doubt in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where is God? Why is God allowing for this to happen to me? So at that moment, it's important for us to understand that our faith, our endurance when it comes to our belief and our conviction and our love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be that which either allows for us to look at shaitan and tell him to get out of our faces or for us to hear him. Because he's going to ask that question, where is your God now? And a second factor that might contribute toward us failing in that last examination that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us is with regards to our deeds. What do I mean? 
that there are some deeds and some actions that a believer can perform that allows for us to bring benefit to our hearts, to our souls in this dunya and in the akhirah. For instance, when I give in charity, a sadaqa tadfa'ul bala, we have the hadith that tells us, right? That the one who gives in charity, it pushes away misfortunes. Which is why it's highly recommended, you're going through difficulty, you put some money in sadaqa, and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to push away all of these difficulties and trials and tribulations. You hear someone who has gotten ill in your family, you can make dua, but in addition to dua, give some money in sadaqa, give some money to the poor, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help cure your love, the, you know, um, fa- family member whom you love and you care about. Amongst the actions that can help and support us at that moment is sadaqa. But at the same time, there are also certain deeds and certain actions of ours that can contribute to us not being so successful at that final moment. For instance, silatul arham, keeping good familial relations with our blood relatives. And also cutting relationships with our close family members. Through a cutting of a relationship of our brother, of our parents, of our grandparents, of our sisters, of our children, whatever it might be, this could be a means that has an impact for us in this dunya and in the akhirah. Someone says, but my family, they've done so much wrong to me. They've done X and Y and Z. That's fine. You're not necessarily doing it for them as much as you're doing it to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how much you take his religion seriously and how much you take his instruction seriously. All it takes is uh, Eid Mubarak text message. Happy birthday. Celebrating birthdays in haram. <laughs> All it takes is a small message, a call once in a while to check in to see how someone is doing. I know that people go through hardship when it comes to relationships. Believe me, I know. I sit with people every day. It's my work. It's hard. I realize that. But where you can demonstrate at the very least to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at the attempt that I'm making. I'm seeking for your sake, O oh Allah, to build this relationship with this family member of mine, even though they have harmed me, even though they have done X and Y and Z to me, it's for you, O oh Allah. Let me give you one example. On the night of Ashura, it is said that Omar ibn Sa'ad dispatches Shimar bin al and some of the army to go toward the camp of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, in order that they can try to get the support of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam and his brothers. Umm al-Banin, salam Allah alayhi, the mother of al-Abbas, was a relative from the same tribe as some of those in the army of Umar bin Sa'at. So they call out, O oh, son of our sister, come and support us. We will grant you, if you choose not to support us, then we will grant you immunity, just go back to Medina. Abdul Fadl Abbas salam, doesn't respond to them. Because why? If they have Al-Abbas salam, things are different, right? They're scared of him. Knowing that their mother, Umm al-Banin, comes from the tribe of some of the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad, they try to get Abdul Fadl Abbas to either come to the tent or come to support Umar ibn Sa'ad or at the very least, we grant him immunity, just go back home. We won't kill you. We'll leave you alone. Abdul Fadl Abbas and his brothers are sitting in the tent and they're calling out, oh son of our sister, come, come, come. Let me talk to you. Let us negotiate with you. Abdul Fadl Abbas is sharpening his sword. Imam al Hussein goes to him and says, oh my brother, they're calling you. Why don't you go? He says, oh, Abu Abdullah, and leave you? He says, no. He says, they are your relatives. At least respond to them. At least respond to them. This is your responsibility. Abu Fadl Abbas, with the killers of Hussein. So he gets out, and he goes to them. And he says, what do you want? And they say, we'll grant you immunity. Abu Fadl Abbas, he responds to them. He says, la'natullah ala amanatak. He says, I don't want you, and I don't want your immunity. But here I am responding to you in the name of my mother, because we are relatives. What I'm trying to say, my friends, 
is that sometimes we're put in difficult positions, but the benefits that it can afford us in this dunya and in the akhira and in those last moments of our life are immense. So to answer this question of how could it happen where someone who believes for 50, 60, 70, 80 years of their life and at the last moment they fail this examination, number one, it could be because of a lack of faith. We might pray, we might fast, but do we have conviction? We might believe, but do we believe when we're going through difficulty and hardship? We need to ask ourselves that question. And number two, do we have certain sins which are prohibiting us from being successful in this journey? All it takes, for instance, is one illness that could mess up a trip that we were going to take. All it takes is one illness. All it takes is one illness. One illness. But what happens? One sin, one deed, one transgression. And it could make this difficult journey so much more obstacle, uh, filled with so many more obstacles and so many more challenges. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Subdimension number three. Then, how is it that we are amongst those who can be successful in this final examination of al adila or at al ihtidar How can we pass the test? when we are surrounded by the angels and we're surrounded by shaitan who is seeking to deceive us in that last moment before we leave this world and transition into the next, this is our last moment. Fate and its determination is to be decided at this second. Number one is to make sure that we truly understand, again, our religion and we truly have an understanding of our aqidah. The first questions that we are asked in the grave is, are what? Men rabbuk. Who is your Lord? Who is Allah? What do you know about Allah? Men nabiyuk. Who is your messenger? Men imamuk. Men qiblatuk. Men kitabuk. What is your book? Where is your qibla? All of these questions. All of these questions are in regards to what we believe in. After that, what are we going to be asked? We're going to be asked about our deeds. So step number one, is what do you believe? وَالْأَصْلِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ All of humanity are at a loss except those who believe and those who do good deeds. First, those who believe. What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have conviction? What does it mean to love? What does it mean to know? What does it mean to have ma'rifah? Do I truly know the God that I'm worshipping? Do I truly understand this Lord who I supplicate to? Do I have conviction that He hears me when I scream out to Him or when I call Him or when I make dua to Him or no? Or do I doubt? Do I wonder if He even listens to anything that I have to say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to keep on going to that door and knocking and knocking and knocking that door. Let me say this, my friends. We said that this shaitan, this iblis, he is there at the time of our death. And I said before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also there with you. Who are you going to allow to win? One lesson that we can learn from shaitan himself. One lesson. I'm going to give you guys one lesson that you can learn from shaitan. Don't take this out of context. There is one really important lesson that we can learn from Iblis himself. Don't give up. He never despairs. Someone believes for 60, 70, 80 years, he's still there at the last moment. At the last moment, at any moment, at this moment, ask God for forgiveness. Try to learn about God now. You say, ah, 30 years already passed, 40 years already passed of my life. What worth do I have now to you know, transition my life from hell to paradise? I'm going to hell anyway, what difference does it make? Think about it, first of all. Let me just put this in perspective for you. Let's say we live for 70 years, right? I'm not good at math, so I'm going to ask you guys all to help me out. If we sleep for one-third of a day, that means one-third of 70 years we're sleeping. How much do we have left? I know that. <laughs> How many years do we have? Huh? 47 years. 46 some odd years, right? We have approximately 47 years. I spend one-third of that life eating, drinking, socializing, using the restroom. I take really long showers, right? So I cut out another one-third. What do I got? 23 years. Of those 23 years, how much have I dedicated in obedience and worship or even thinking about God? 
thinking about religion, thinking about my responsibility, if I live 70 years, Allahu Akbar. How much of it? I'm too busy working, too busy studying, I'm too busy doing this, I'm too busy doing that, I'm too busy on whatever. What I'm trying to say is that life and the opportunities that we get are this small. And that's okay, that's the nature of this world. But at the same time, then if we're throwing away whatever little bit that we have left and say, it's too late for me anyway, what are you doing? Step number one to be successful in that journey is to know your religion, to know your aqidah, know who God is, know who your prophet is, know who your imam is, know what is going to happen in the world beyond this one. This is knowledge that has been contained and exposed to us by the prophet and his family. This is number one. The second step again then, to do good deeds. Anyone can do deeds, but to do good deeds. Amilu salihat, salih. To do and to perform actions that are sincere. As a hadith from the Imam Salamullah Alayhi states, that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will emanate His mercy to the extent that God will look at our prayers. And look at our prayers. Look at my prayers, man. My worthless prayers, where I'm thinking about everything other than my prayer. Yet out of the mercy of God, he will look at all of our prayers. And he will look for two rakah of prayers that were performed in sincerity. And if we perform two rakah of prayers that were sincere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will admit us into paradise. Two. Two. Out of how many I pray a day? Obligatory 17. The recommended, do your best. Now out of those two, the hadith it says, another hadith says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take one qiyam and one ruku and one sujood and one tashahud and one salam. He will do his best to find sincere prayers, two rakah, combine them together just as an excuse to allow for us to enter into paradise. What else do we need? But it starts with again opening up ourself to understanding that we need to have some sense of sincerity, some sense of knowledge, some sense of conviction while we're praying. How do we cultivate that? How do we cultivate that? Drown yourself in du'a. Drown yourself in supplication. Drown yourself in the remembrance of God. Recite du'a Abu Hamza al-Thimani. Open up Sayyid for the Sajjadiyya. Read du'a Imam al Hussein that he recites on the day of Arafah. Read du'a Kumail, du'a Sabah. When you recite these supplications, they give us a complete new wind with regards to how we see God. And that helps inform every aspect of our life, including our prayers, including our ritualistic acts of worship. We learn lesson from them, we take inspiration from them, we get motivation from them, so they're able to be successful in this journey. Thirdly, fulfill our responsibilities and don't be over-reliant on God's mercy. Someone says, all you do talk about is God's mercy. And now you're telling us, don't be reliant on God's mercy. We have to be between hope and fear. لَا يَكُونُ مُؤْمِن مُؤْمِنًا حَتَّى يَكُونُ خَائِفًا رَاجَعًا A believer is not a believer until he or she is fearful yet hopeful. إِلَهِ إِذَا رَعَيْتُ ذُنُوبِ فَزَأْتُ وَإِذَا رَعَيْتُ كَرَمَكَ تَمَعْتُ Oh Allah, when I look at my sins, I become fearful. But when I see your grace and I see your mercy, I become greedy for it. Be humble, in other words. Don't assume that that last moment of my life at Al-Ihtadar is going to be easy. I'm good. Because I wept for Hussein. Because I made ziyara of Hussein. Because I came to Majlis. Because I did that one deed of charity. Because I gave to that homeless person on the street. So I'm good at that lie. I'm, I'm good in that moment. And I'm definitely going to be in the company of the Prophet. Be humble, man. Woman. Be humble. Don't be so confident. Don't be so over-reliant. Every time you take a look at your good deed, also take a look at your bad deeds. And hold yourself to account. I hold myself to account so I can grow, so I can reach a higher station, so I can reach a higher status. When I pray, I look within myself and I say, I prayed today, alhamdulillah. But how much of my mind was truly on prayer? I fast during the holy month of Ramadan, but how many times did I get angry at my children because I was not caffeinated during Ramadan while I was fasting? I went for Hajj. But when I went for Hajj, truly, 
Did I have any conception and understanding in ma'rifah of what it was that I was doing? Or was I so focused on getting the tasks done? I gave in charity. But did I really give or was I annoyed the fact that I had to give out of my own wealth? What is it? To be between a state of hope and fear consistently allows for us to live a life of caution and precaution at every moment. And thus, even at that last second, we'll be living in a state of precaution. So when that shaitan, he comes to us and he says, do you really believe in this God? Let me show you something far better. You're going to say no. That same God that I trusted in my entire life. As difficult as this moment might be for me, I still trust him. And I entrust all of my affairs to him because he is the Lord of the worlds and he is the most merciful and he's the most compassionate and he's the most loving and I know that he supports me. Which is why I'll conclude with this. When someone is about, uh, when someone is about to be buried in the last moments before we lower their body into the grave and even after we have lowered their body into the grave and covered them with sand, we perform a ritual that is recommended known as talqeen. Talqeen is a reminder that we give to the soul that has just passed away such that they are able to answer the questions that are posed to them by the angels successfully and accurately once the family and the loved ones and the community has left their burial scene. What do we recite in this talqeen? We recite many different lines, and it's fairly lengthy, but I want to reflect upon a couple of them really quickly. Amongst them we say, Ya Fulan bin Fulan. In other words, when you are going to be reciting my talqeen one day, you will say, O Fayaz, the son of Ibrahim. إِذَا أَتَاكَ الْمَلَكَانَ الْمُقَرَّبَانَ الرَّسُولَيْنَ مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى سألك أنا رب أنا ربك وأن نبيك وأن دينك وأن كتابك وأن قبلتك وأن وأن أئمتك that on that moment when the angels come to you and they ask you who is your Lord and what is your qibla and what is your book and who is your prophet and who are your imams فلا تخاف ولا تحزن don't be fearful don't get scared and don't grieve don't worry about it. Why? وَقُولْ وَقُلْ فِي جَوَابِهِمَا Allah Jalla جَلَالَهُ Rabbi وَنِعْمُ Rabb. That respond to them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Lord and He is the best of Lords. And that my Prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala and He is the best of Prophets. And that my book is the Qur'an and the Qur'an is the best of books. And that my qibla is the Kaaba. And that that qibla is the best of qiblas. And that my Imam is Ali and Hassan and Hussein and Ali bin Hussein and Muhammad bin Ali and Ja'far bin Muhammad and Musa bin Ja'far and Ali bin Musa and Muhammad bin Ali and Ali bin Muhammad and Hassan ibn Ali and al Hujjat ibn al Hassan and they are the best of Imams. When I have that Lord, who is the most merciful of those who show mercy, and I have this book, the Holy Quran, and I have this Qibla, which is the house of God in the holy precinct, and I have the Prophet of God, sallallahu alayhi wa who is the mercy unto the worlds, and I have Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein and the Imams that come from their progeny, and they are the best of creation after the Prophet of God sallallahu alayhi wa what do I have to fear and what do I have to grieve? What do I have? What's there to worry about? I have Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa Through them, I find you, O oh Allah. And through them, you have taught us how to find you, O oh Allah. So allow for us to be successful in this journey as we transition from this world into the next and allow for them to be there in my company in those final moments. And allow for them to greet me in the barzakh. And allow for me to hold their hand 
as you transition me from the barzakh to the day of judgment and allow for me to walk with them into paradise in, your, in their company. What else do we need? What else do we want? We have the best of provisions. We have Allah. We have Rasulullah. We have Ahlul Bayt Have confidence in that. But with that also comes responsibility. That responsibility is to act like them, is to be like them, is to love them a love that is transformational, a love that allows for us to reach the heights and the stations of those who we have come to remember during the course of these nights. My friends, I've lectured you enough on this evening. Tonight is the night of the 9th of Muharram. Where that time is quickly passing and quickly we are approaching the day of tragedy that has befallen upon the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And tonight we recollect the tragedy of that young man. 25, 26, 27 years old according to different reports who was this beloved of his father Aba Abdullah al-Husayn. And in fact, as the poet writes, that Hussein alayhi salam, he died three times before he died on the day of Ashura. The first one of those is when Ali al-Akbar came to bid him farewell. The second time is when Ali al-Akbar called out, Aba alayka min nisada. And the third time was when Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam saw the decapitated body of his son, Ali al-Akbar. You know, if you're a parent or you have children in your house, you watch your child grow every single day. And you see their interactions, you see their behaviors, you imagine what life is going to be like them, going to be for them 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road. But you know what's really, really painful? Is when a parent has to watch their child pass away in front of their eyes. Sometimes we expect our parents to go before us. But imagine how difficult the circumstance and the situation is when the parent has to watch the child go. In the story of Yaqub, he sends Yusuf alayhi salam with his brothers. Yaqub alayhi salam is watching Yusuf go with his brothers as they're leaving the home. Eventually we know that Yusuf is thrown into the well. At the end of the day, Yaqub, he had a little bit of belief and confidence even that his son Yusuf was alive. But what happens to Yaqub except that he weeps and that he grieves until he becomes blind. For Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura, when he, watched Ima, when he watched Ali al-Akbar rush toward the battlefield, he didn't have a conviction that he was going to return. The only thing that he was certain about was that Ali al-Akbar was going to die, but he didn't know in which way. And in which way, oh Abba Abdullah. After every single one of the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had been killed, the first from Banu Hashim to come to Imam al Hussein salam Allah alayhi was Ali al-Akbar. It could have been anyone else. It could have been his brothers. It could have been his cousins. But Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, as well as Ali al Akbar, want to show that they are in it. They are in it and they are loyal and that they are ready to sacrifice themselves on this day. Ali al Akbar, he comes to his father, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And he looks at Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi. He's already wearing his armor. He's already wearing his shield. He's already holding on to his sword. He's already on top of the horse, meaning it's already going to happen. He looks at Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and he says, Ya Abata, Ya Aba Abdullah, do you give me permission to go and fight? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, what's he going to tell his son? You know what happens? It is said that he just embraces his son Ali al Akbar and they both fall unconscious. We said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he falls unconscious twice on the day of Ashura. The first was when he bid farewell farewell to Ali al-Akbar, the second time when he bids farewell to Qasim, it is said a few moments later, he rises up 
Ali al-Akbar stands up and it is said that at this moment Ali al-Akbar, he gets on top of his horse. Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam doesn't have any words for him. So he says, go, O oh my son, Akbar. It is said that at this moment, as he's riding toward the middle of the battlefield, Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, he makes out, he calls out a cry. He makes a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Allahumma ashhad ala ha'ula al-qawm qad baraza ilayhim ghulaman ashbahun nas he says, Oh Allah, bear witness against these people for this young man who is leaving our tent is the one who looked and the one who acted and the one who spoke exactly like Rasulullah. It is said that when, when Ali al-Akbar was young, that whenever Banu Hashim missed their grandfather Rasulullah, they would look at Ali al-Akbar because his face appeared in the same presence of his great-grandfather Rasulullah. It is said that Ali al-Akbar, he goes out into the middle of the battle Field. He begins to recite his epic lines of poetry. Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. Nahnu wa baytullah awla bin Nabi. Adribukum bis saif. Ahmi an Abi. Dharaba ghulam in Hashimi in Alawi. Ali al Akbar. He goes out. He fights 120 people. Imam al Hussein is watching the scene unfold. It is said that he's looking diligently at his son Akbar. When at this moment it is said that Layla, she's peering from, from inside the tent. She's She's looking at Ali, she's looking at Imam Hussein's face. Whenever the Imam smiled, she knows that something good happened in battle. And at this moment, it is said that Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, he began to have a worried face. So Layla says, "Oh my husband, Abu Abdullah, what is happening to my son Ali al Akbar? He doesn't know what to say. You know, so you know what he says. He says, "Oh Layla, my grandfather Rasulullah said that in moments of desperation, that when someone makes a du'a, when the mother makes a desperate du'a, Allah subhanahu wa taala will respond." So make dua that your son returns back to us. So at this moment, it is said that Layla in the tent, she raises her hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She says, Oh Allah, you are the one who returned Yusuf back to Yaqub. I ask you bi ghurbat al Hussein. I ask you bi atash al Hussein. I ask you by the loneliness of my husband Abu Abdullah. I ask you by the thirst of Hussein. Allow for me to see my son Ali al Akbar one final time. It is said that Ali Akbar takes out his sword, he strikes that enemy, and he rushes is back toward the tents of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein is there to greet him. He embraces him. Ali al Akbar says, oh, oh my father, Abdul, how am I doing? He says, Am I fighting well? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He says, But God bless you, you're doing wonderful, just as your grandfather Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know what he says? Ali al Akbar says, Oh my father, Abba Abdullah, inna al Atash qad qatalani. He said, If I have the opportunity to get one sip of water, I can destroy the entirety of the army, but the thirst of Karbala is killing me. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam doesn't know what to do. So you know what he says according to a report? It says that he kisses Imam, he kisses Ali al Akbar on the lips, and at this moment, Ali Akbar begins to walk backwards and he says, I'm so sorry, oh father, I didn't realize you were more thirsty than I. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he says to Akbar, Go and bid farewell to your mother, she's waiting for you in the tent. It is said that he goes inside, he embraces his mother Layla, he bids farewell to Lady Zainab alayhi salam. At that moment, one final time, he goes out and he begins to rush toward the enemy of Amr ibn Sa'ad. At this moment, one m member of the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad calls out that if we let the grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib continue to fight in this way, he will destroy all of us. So surround him. It is said that at this moment, the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad, they surround Ali al-Akbar. One man strikes him from the right. Another man strikes him on the left collarbone. One man, he takes a spear and he drives it through the chest of Ali al-Akbar. Another man comes and he takes a sword which hits the head of Ali al-Akbar. At this moment, blood begins to gush out. And at this moment, the blood from the head of Ali al-Akbar goes on top of the horse. The horse doesn't know which way to go. Instead of retreating back to the tent of Imam al Hussein, it enters into the tents of Amr ibn Sa'ad. One man strikes him from the right, another man strikes him from the left. At this moment, he calls out, Abu alaykum in this salam. Oh my father, my last salam upon you. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He gets on top of the horse. He begins to ride as fast as he can. At this moment, Sukaina, she exits from the tent and she says, Oh my father, Abu Abdullah, you're riding the wrong way. My brother Akbar is on the right. You're riding to the left. You know what he says? He says, La chalumini hadha bunayya Ali. He says, Don't blame me. This is my son Ali.
It said at this moment, finally, slowly by slowly, he reaches the body, but in what state? The decapitated body of his son. As Ali al Akbar was gasping for air, you know what happens? Hamid ibn Muslim, he says, I saw Hussein alayhi salam at that first moment when he saw the body of Ali al Akbar. It's as if he was going to die himself out of grief. You know, when you're going through a really difficult news, when, when you hear really difficult news, you can't feel your legs. It is said that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was trying to alight from the horse, but he couldn't feel his legs. So he pushed himself off the horse. He landed on top of the body of Ali al-Akbar. And he begins to call out, Ya Bunaya inna dunya ba'dak al He says, Oh Ali, after you, this life is no longer worth living. It is said that he places the head of Akbar on his lap. At this moment, he holds him closely to his chest. I'll leave the rest and all the details for you for the day of Ashura. But let me just say this last piece. It is said that Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, he tries to pick up the body of Ali al-Akbar, but he can't do so. He's in so much pain, he's in so much grief, so he looks back toward Banu Hashim, and he says, someone please come and help me, come oh brothers of Akbar, pick up my son, I don't have the energy to do so at this moment. Allah, Allah, not Allah. Allah, the people of the Zalimeen, inna lillah. وإنا إليه راجعون سلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين رسك الله سبحانه وتعالى with tears in our eyes and with grief in our hearts to Allah for us to be amongst those who live a life that resembles the life of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad and to grant us a death that resembles the death of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow for these tears to be a means which purify these hearts and souls, such that we are able to walk in the footsteps of Al Hussein and his grandfather Rasulullah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us their ziyarah in this life, and their shafa'a in this life, and in the barzakh and in the next life. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala al tahirin. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.